it's all communism and sex magic today. Okay. Um, <laughs> where are we? Hello and welcome to Catholic Unscripted episode. Oh Lord. Forty-nine. Hello and welcome to Catholic Unscripted episode forty-nine. I'm Catherine Bennett. I'm Mark Lambert. I'm Gavin Ashenden. Don't cut that bit out. That was very good. <laughs> well, we've oft heard it said, is the Pope a Catholic? But the question today is, is the Pope a communist? Why are the BBC asking this question, Mark? Well, quite simply, because he's a bit of a communist. <laughs> <laughs> show us show us the article mark let's have a look to do that first oh hang on a sec yeah, so, well, um, but it, no, so this is an article from uh 2015 so it's not like a new thing um where you've got ed Stoughton on the from the bbc asking is the pope a communist yeah so like my point really is that this goes mm. right back to the beginning of the papacy like since his election, he's been accused of promoting. Like I think the important connection to make is this connection between um, Pope Francis and liberation theology. Would you agree, Gavin? Like mm. that's really where where we're coming from with this. Um, yes, I think so, and and not and not not just because it it makes sense in terms of what he's doing, and you know what you've just shown, as you say, comes from seven or eight years ago. But the fact that he's just drawn round him in dialogue some marxists is is really it's quite an odd thing to do of all the people you mm. might want to have a cheerful dialogue with why why them and as somebody said if you're going to tell a beleaguered ideological group to keep on going and not give up it wouldn't be marxists it ought to be traditional catholics um yeah. so and there was i'm very sorry i've forgotten who it was but in the last two or three weeks somebody has written uh, a fairly serious intellectual comic critic has written an article saying um, that either the Pope is 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 losing it in, mentally, or he's stupid, or else he's a communist, um, because only those three explanations uh, deal with the way he behaves. And he's not losing it mentally yet. He's certainly not stupid. So there's some scope for asking the question, actually, really quite seriously, more more seriously maybe than Ed Stoughton did. I was wondering if Mark's eyebrow raised a little there when you said he's certainly not stupid. Is that your take, Mark? Oh, do you know, I, I, I was funny. I was having this conversation with someone earlier on today and, you know, like they were saying he's not stupid, he's got a plan. And I know that's what Gavin sort of feels about it as well. But, um, you know, like any anyone who did the Fiducia Supplicans, dis, like complete disaster, he's, he doesn't strike me as that, bright really you know like how could you not predict that that uh james martin wasn't going to immediately go to the new york times and do gay marriages basically you know how could you not predict that everyone who well, wanted other, to do that would do it straight other, away i mean it was obvious wasn't it the, well the other side of the argument mark is that they did predict That's what it, they wanted. and they, they they wanted it and it it adds you know it's outriders doing his work for him they're slightly <laughs> from but essentially um if if the intention is a form of Argentinian semi peronist confusion, uh, it's working very well. I mean, if you were to say in the last seven years, were his aim to be to, under the uh, under the guise of chaos and confusion, to shift the whole of the Catholic Church several notches towards the progressive, political, therapeutic, and sexualized end, well, he's done it. So that that was quite clever. Mm. But you can't deny the fact that Fiducia Supplicants has been an utter train wreck. And that well, we don't you know, know yet. Like, there must we... have been a better way of coming coming, you know, like they've basically completely cut off the, the church in Africa now. You've got right. everyone's got a different perspective. Um, you know, like, like the thing with the book that we're talking about with Cardinal Fernandez, where it was they all knew about it. It's come out in the news this weekend that Pope Francis like Cardinal Fernandez has said that Pope Francis knew all about the book. And like us lot are going, well, of course he did. We know he did because they tried to erase its existence. So he was obviously embarrassed about it. Otherwise, he wouldn't have done that, would he? I think could, we, we'll only... could, we, um, could we return to Viducia Suplicans um, in a moment? And just because we began with communism, for anyone watching who may have stumbled across us or be interested in Christianity and just wanting to learn, can you can one of you explain what? Why there's a conflict between communism and our Catholic faith? Why is it a problem 
Um, and why are we sort of laughing to say the Pope might be a, a communist? And of course, he, as you said, he gathered this little group of Marxists and um, spoke explicitly about the evils of dictatorships, mentioning Nazism, but didn't, even though he might well have wanted to, talk about the evils of communism. Uh, it has, we know, been uh, roundly criticised by the church and Pope John Paul II came out of communism and uh, and was able to give a real clarity of understanding to the problems of it. But but um, for, for those people watching who might be thinking, maybe young people, because, you know, when, when I was at school, a lot of young people were, you know, considered themselves kind of, well, I doubt communists, but they might have erred that way. Why is there this conflict and why is it problematic, Mark, who's got his book out? Well, this, so this is the catechism. Should we start there with the catechism yeah, of the Catholic Church? There's a moment, I think, to um, try and explain. So basically, if you want to look this up, guys, and you can put, if you put in the catechism of the Catholic Church into Google and then the paragraph number, you'll get this text, right? So 1883 says, um, socialization presents dangers. Excessive intervention by the state can threaten personal freedom and initiative. So really, this is what it's about, right? There's a conflict between what the church teaches is subsidiarity, which is the idea that everything, all the decisions are made at the co at the mo at the lowest possible level, so that you have got responsibility for your actions. That's where it begins, and in the family, you have got responsibility for your family. So that's basically what the church teaches. The teaching of the church has elaborated the principle of subsidiarity, according to which a community of a higher order should not interfere in the internal life of a community of a lower order, depriving the latter of its functions, but rather should support should, should, should support it in case of need and help to coordinate in its activity with the activities of the rest of society, always with a view to the common good. And on collectivism, which is also all forms, if you don't know, Marxism, socialism, are all forms of collectivism and Nazism and, you know, social communism and all that. The principle of subsidiarity is opposed to all forms of collectivism. It sets limits for state intervention. It aims at harmonising the relationships between individuals and societies. It tends towards the establishment of true international order. So that's what the church teaches about it. Can I add to that? It contradicts Christianity at every important level in three ways in particular. The first is it has an entirely different view of human nature. It thinks human nature is perfectible, and it sets out to perfect it politically. Christianity teaches human nature is not perfectible. We have to be saved and then and then changed. Then it's then it's wrong about human nature because it deals with people not in terms of their individual merits and responsibilities, but as Mark was saying, as part of a collective, and defines people by their collective identity, as cultural Marxism does too. And thirdly, its operation is, is totalitarian power, uh, and the church believes that the use of totalitarian power is utterly anti-human. God instead uses love. So for those three reasons, at the essential points where your philosophy of life is constructed, it's the exact opposite of Christianity. And then if you add a fourth reason, which is that every single time uh, it gets any power at all, the first thing it does is to make a beeline for the church to destroy it and to destroy the family. So the idea, given particularly the last 100 years, and especially the Spanish Civil War uh, and what that's taught us, that, that there is any common cause that can be made with our greatest political and ideological enemy is absolutely nuts. And Rod Dreher said this. Rod Dreher said, pardon me, Rod Dreher said, look, Communism has killed over 100 million people in the last 100 years, many of them Christians, many of them priests and nuns. Why on earth would would a leader of the Catholic Church want to have a joint negotiation with our most pernicious enemy? Mm, yeah. So perhaps we could I, explain I, that, should we, at this point, that, that we haven't actually said what it is we're actually <laughs> talking about, have we? Which is this story, um, here it is on um, Vatican News. Uh, which the Pope encourages Marxists and Christians to fight corruption and uphold yeah. the rule of law. So Pope Francis meets with representatives of this dialogue, transversal dialogue project. And uh, some, I was just telling the guys earlier on that um, someone on Twitter said to me, what do you expect him to do if he's got to meet with this group of Marxists? He's not going to tell them that they've you know, killed more people, committed 
worse genocide than anyone else in history. And my response was, well, perhaps he should. That might be a good start. And the second thing was that he actually started this group. This is a group that he started. So we go back again to this uh, history. We go back to what, you know, what I was saying at the beginning, which is that from his election, he's been accused of promoting liberation theology, which is a, a, a theological movement that emerged, emerged in the 1970s and mm -hmm. was particular really to Latin America. And the aim, of, the, the aim of the movement was addressing the concerns of the poor and oppressed. Now it's ringing bells, isn't it? Because that's another one of Pope Francis's sort of main leap motifs of his papacy. It's mm. characterised by a special concern for the poor and for a commitment to justice. It's therefore easy to draw a parallel, I think, you know, with, with the Franciscan papacy. But the movement presents a, di like a diversity of theological positions and its di doctrinal frontiers are really poorly defined. And it's been, mm. as a result of that, it's been criticised for its use of concepts borrowed from various currents of Marxist thought. Um, some theologians and exegetes associated with liberation theology have conducted an analysis inspired by materialistic doctrines, including Marxist principles of the class struggle. And you can see the Pope's thought um, and motivation and his like, criticism of um, you know, mark, market economies is very close. Like, these are the things that have caused people like Ed Stewart and in the BBC article that we just showed um, to ask, you know, is he a communist? Because it's like his economic thought and which is basically, you know, like there's that old thing. Uh, someone wrote a book about him saying he was the political pope. And you can see that coming across in a lot of this ideology. But basically, consistently, he's, he's been sort of promoting Marxist ideas all the way through the last 10 years of his papacy. And you, mm. you saw it especially in, um, what was the one about the, the climate that he did? Blimey, it slipped my memory. The encyclical or the, you know the one I mean, though. God, it was yeah. awful. It was like four hours of my life I'll never get back again. <laughs> the most recent one? No, no, no. The, uh, what the was first. it one? The one on climate change. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's it's this, the, the danger of it is, uh, and I think C.S. Lewis and Gavin, as the expert, can correct me if I go wrong, but C.S. Lewis addresses this very problem of uh, collectivism versus individualism in mere Christianity, I think it is, and warns, as he often does, against the dangers of any extremes. And uh, the, the, one of the great concerns of communism is, and people have often said this, it's, it's something Peterson talks about as well, is that something might be good in theory, or at least you might see the value of it in theory, but it never translates in practice. And it imposes an unjust equality on people and you think isn't equality a good thing but it imposes an unjust equality where something like nazism imposed an unjust inequality in nazism we were we were you know it was the jews are lesser they're in outremensch and then in communism your it doesn't matter your individual differences because marx was inspired by Hegel, wasn't he and you've got the hegelian dialectic which is something we've linked to francis as well before so so you i understand what you're saying Catherine, but isn't it the you know the the same thing in Marxism where you've got it sets up the you know the bourgeoisie and the proletariat. So you've got that that same Hegelian dialectic. Like what it starts by doing is dividing us into you know you yes. have to hate these people the because they're not the same group as you. Well, that's the thing. It's the division. Whether it's the division, yeah. um, you know, and and actually, in order to have that equalizing, that leveling, it. It, you have to prevent natural, like you were talking about natural law, it, it necessarily interferes with natural law and, and suppresses the natural. And, and in order to actually really impose that, it ends in the lives of, you know, ends in the destruction of human life. So and they always, um, they always, yeah. they always turn to power to enforce what they can't get any other way. Mm. But Catherine's point about it being unjust equality hit the nail on the head. You can't produce equality that they want. Mm. Uh, they, you, they ought to produce equality of uh, opportunity. That's a very good idea. But it's instead, it's a matter of equality of outcome, outcome, which can't be done. And as Peterson always says, the attempt to, to, to produce equality of outcome involves destroying people, to, to destroying mm. their, to, taking away their liberty. And, and killing them. But the, the thing is, anyone who's got any sense of 20th century history 
knows very well that Marxism is a wholly antithetic to Christianity. What it sets out to do is not believing in a God and not believing in heaven. It sets out to create heaven on earth. <clears throat> and it does what it does instead is to make dystopias. And, yeah. and I, grew, I grew up reading the Gulag Archipelago, mm. and you couldn't have had a clearer yeah. dystopia than that. And so <laughs> uh, one of the first things I did on conversion was I got hold of a, a book. It was actually Roger Guraudi. I remember his name now from 1975. Bless wrote you. a book about um, the uh, the convergence of just as the Pope appears to be doing now between communism and Christianity. And I, I flirted with it for three or four months thinking, I really hope this works because this is really cool. I will look so cool if I'm a communist Christian. Uh, yes. and, 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 it, and it looked, I'm afraid, I'm afraid I was more worried about looking cool than I was about world peace. But there mm. we are. I was only late out of adolescence. But but this is my this is the point is you said anyone who's got a sense of sorry do go back that anyone who's got a sense of 20th century uh, history and a, a lot of a lot of people simply won't because our history no. our education system is terrible our sense of history is awful and therefore it's easy you just talked about your when you were young you wanted to you thought it was cool that still is pervasive that idea that this association with these I, these ideologies is somehow cool and i think what francis is doing pope francis is doing which is unhelpful is he is pandering to that he is giving that impression that yes there is some cool association and that and that's really um young people really buy into that and i think i don't want to go as far as to say there's a cynical attempt to do that but that is the result of what will happen sorry gavin carry on well, i've just i've just in my mind's eye i've got a, a meeting room with pope john paul ii come back from the dead a bit like elijah and moses on the mount of transfiguration saying to francis how stupid are you you must know i mean the fact that we the fact that we have john so paul II think is stupid <laughs> it didn't take um, long did it <laughs> Well, I, I, I was speaking rhetorically. Um, I think perhaps I'd say... It's always a good okay, get-out. How, how, oh, you see, I don't want to be rude to the Pope. It's so embarrassing. Um, but, but if he's not stupid, then, then it must be bad faith or, or, or sub-Christian. And so we're back to this article. Is, I mean, this article actually posited the idea that Pope Francis was a Marxist sleeper who'd got into the church in order to destroy it. Because look, they said, he appears to have Marxist predispositions and he's destroying the church. You could, you, I mean, uh, you could hardly be a more destructive pope than he's been in terms yeah. of uh, destroying the equilibrium and the, and the coherence of Catholic church and Catholic teaching. I mean, uh, and looking back now, the first time I came across his, his changing the death penalty, I thought, oh, that, that's a hostage to fortune. That's a mistake. But on that very platform, overturning the whole of the magisterium, about whether or not the state has a right to take to impose a death penalty in certain circumstances, whether you like it or not, whether it's ideal or not, the the, the 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 if you like the cosmic justice of it was the issue. He overturned that unilaterally. Well, the moment you allow a pope to do that, and nobody stopped him doing it or or exposed it for being utterly inimical to the magisterium, you can change anything, and that's what he's doing. So he's either doing it well. He must. He's clearly doing it on purpose, and therefore. He can't. I'm so sorry. I can't believe I'm saying this, but he can't be a Catholic. Well, I, this is what um, I, I think we discussed, and I said back in thirty something, exactly that point that I think the, the on the death penalty to watch out because it's not to do with sex. It's not as glamorous. It's not as hot button. And I think it was overlooked. But all, we all discussed that and said, look what's happening. We saw this, it. this, yeah, we saw it. And, it. and and please do go back revisit old episodes. No, we we mentioned but actually, it. Yes, this was. This is. <laughs> almost this Trojan horse to get through this, this uh, uh, to, to move to things uh, in the sexual arena, as we've just seen now with Fiducia Supercons, mm. which we can revisit. But um, I, I'll say again, and, and this is perhaps for new listeners and new viewers who haven't watched us all through, because I'll be repeating myself for those that have. Um, I've said it many times, but if you haven't yet, it's well worth reading Pope Benedict XVI's Jesus of Nazareth and especially I think it's so pertinent at the moment there's a chapter on the temptations of Christ and he deals with this very like this very problem where people will um, be tempted to say well if you really are a saviour isn't the first thing you do provide bread for everyone and make sure that there was no poverty and no hunger and that mm. that desire to be really nice and um, compassionate can is 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 exactly that it's a temptation but it's a temptation that is 
it's false it's wrong-headed it's not the way we should be we should be looking at it but that's brilliantly esp- espoused in 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 uh, um uh, pope benedict's jesus of nazareth i so, think it, is it worth saying as well that like we understand that for young people why um communism is attractive because it yeah. if you're if you're in a position a power, you know when you're a young person and you haven't really under, you know you like that without being patronizing but you 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 know you might not understand your place in the world or you know it's it's tempting to think that there's this um you know perfect idea of on heaven on earth where mm-hmm. everyone is equal and everyone gets the same amount of money and all this sort of thing and you can be equal with all the people and as you get older perhaps you get a bit more cynical but you start to realize you know as you get older you tend to get more sort of conservative and and see that it's just a lie that that is just a lie and every it's time cynicism. it's been tried every time it's been attempted it has failed miserably and resulted in the death of millions and millions of people mm. but it's not cynicism and and i think probably we ought to try and be as philosophically coherent as we can yeah in my mind the the, the map i have of this goes back to rousseau and the french revolution Mm. So just just you know after the Renaissance and after the Enlightenment, just as, as civilization was developing some muscle, what it could or couldn't do, given that one of the con- constant hymn the sins of humanity is um, hubris, we think more of ourselves than we deserve. A philosophical idea came about that human beings could be made better by education and better conditions, and the whole of left if po- left if politics has pursued that since Rousseau, and it was the platform upon which the French Revolution and the Communist Revolution were both built. But then if you look and see what actually happened, either from both revolutions, you see disaster and an enormous death toll. And so you are entitled to ask whether or not Rousseau's idea that human beings are not flawed but are perfectible is true. And and it's completely, it's the facts say it's nonsense. Then you look at Auschwitz and the Holocaust, uh, and and the, the Jewish Christian narrative that human beings um, have got this extraordinary potential, but this very profound flaw, and then ask the question, how is that flaw to be dealt with? And the answer is that everyone who's encountered Jesus appears to have it dealt with well. And so here we have these two models. One works, one doesn't work. It's not about being cynical. It's about being clear-sighted about human nature and the philosophy of human nature that we should adopt. And that's why we're entitled to be really very muscular about resisting leftish uh, anthropologies based on this idea that you just need resources and education, which politicians say every single day on the radio to make things better. It isn't true, and we know it's not true. Yeah, we absolutely need an understanding of original sin. Without without an understanding of original original sin, without the right anthropology understanding of the human person, it, you're all it's always going to go awry. And as as you've just said, um, sorry, Mark. Well, we had that we had Ed Pfizer, didn't we? Brilliantly tweeted. You know, he was he said that there was like ten of the last popes all spoke out against yeah. communism. <laughs> And he gave brilliant quotes, you know, I mean, I can go through a couple of them. Uh, the unspeakable doctrine of communism, as it is called, is a doctrine most opposed to the very natural law, Pius the Ninth, mm. qui pluri- pluribus. Uh, there is nothing in common between social Christian and Christian democracy. They differ from each other as much as the sect of socialism differs from the profession of Christianity, Leo the Thirteenth. I mean, you like there's low, there's loads of stuff out there that very clearly you've got the magisterium right so we want to i think that's an you know this is an inc- a growing question now and um the there's a so i was talking to janet smith you know professor janet smith about this and i've been speaking to lots of people about this like to try and gauge what the position is on the magisterium as we go you know and, uh, I like, love that. In the Catholic world saying, I was just chatting to Janet Smith, who's yeah. like someone in the secular world, saying, I just rang Beyonce the other day. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And yeah. she is brilliant. You know, yeah. she's absolutely brilliant. Um, and she was, so she, <laughs> she was saying, let's, so she said, I really want to talk to you about this. She said, like, you know, let's, and she, she said, it's a, a complex position um, and a difficult one under Pope Francis because the, there are historically, and I've got Common Check open on my, so I don't know if uh, readers are familiar with this, but like these are some really heavyweight Catholic books. But this is a, 
the new dictionary of philosophy. And one of the things that Komijek says on the on the magisterium is that throughout history there have been times when the magisterium has said things and late and that's been wrong. So there are degrees of um, absolutism, if you like, in term when we talk about the magisterium. Um, with Pope Francis's pronouncements, we've also got a situation where uh, some of those might, you know, it's very likely the way that like fiducia supplicants has been, you know, the, because the magisterium is meant to be the Pope with the bishops. Yeah. So if he wrote something, you know, at Christmas about the incarnation and everyone would be behind him, wouldn't be a problem. That'd be magisterial, you know, and it depends how in, how in sync it is with scripture mm. and tradition and stuff like that. So mm. you've got all these sort of uh, personal opinions that he's throwing out. You know, there's a really good question. How magisterial are they? And a guy called, a professor called Rist has just written a book. It's hot off the presses, but I've ordered a copy. So I should have that by the next episode and uh, like should be firmly through it. So Janet basically said, let's both read this book and then we'll get together and we'll have a good old discussion about what, you know, how the magisterium works with this. So I'm very, very fortunate to be able to have access to, um, you know, someone as erudite as Professor Janet Smith, and we can hopefully then we can come to our audience and we'll, we'll have some good answers. Yeah, very good. So well, I, it, it would I, be well worth go on, Gavin. Sorry, you paused on my screen. Well, what, well I, I, I waved because I got the, I wanted to, to yeah. jump in at this point after what Mark had said. So, as, as a relatively new Catholic, I think one of the things that I've been most concerned about is exactly the question of the le legitimacy of the magisterium and how it works. Um, and I was helped the other day by Joseph Shaw, the chairman of the Latin Mass Society, who is also a professor of psychology of philosophy at, at Oxford. And, and one of the things Joseph said was he, he articulated very clearly something I'm just beginning to get my head round, which is that the part of the problem that we have is not just Francis, but really the last 100 years since Vatican I. So the suggestion is that Vatican I created a certain amount of papal overreach for some very good philosophical questions, but nonetheless, it went too far. And because it went too far, it's left us with uh, an impossible to resolve conundrum because having invested so much in the relationship between the hold of the papal office and the magisterium, if the Pope gets it wrong, there's no way to row back. But on the other hand, if, if we dial it down a bit and we say, as Mark began to say, that the magisterium really only, if you like, reaches high octane when the Pope and the bishops together are saying coherent things. Not only are they saying it together, but they're saying it in complete ideological sync with everything in the past. That's magisterium. And what that means is that Pope Francis by himself, without the bishops, producing Amoris Letitia and, and FS, it's not magisterium, but the problem no, is that because we've become so papalized, so ultramontane, if you like, the ha there isn't anything within the last 100 years of Catholic ecclesiology to allow us to refer to it, like a communication cord. You know, stop the train. It, it's gone down the wrong points. We need to back up and go to where the points are. We need to back up 100 years in the way in which we understand the Pope's relationship to his teaching authority. And, there and, are a few and until we can do that, one second. Until we can do that, we're stuck. So that's that. You, I think Janet's absolutely right. That's that's the ecclesial task, the immediate ecclesial task, in order mm. to allow us to get Pope Francis's heterodoxy off the back of the church, and not to allow it to present it as magisterium. Well, yeah, it's going to be really interesting to see how, how the church <laughs> deals with this coming out of it. And you know, I've seen. I sort of try and keep up with. Uh, what other people are saying, you know, mm -hmm. from other um, churches or ecclesial communities. And um, I'm, you know, like a lot of people are saying, oh, this is de facto schism and all that sort of thing. And I love the fact, Gavin, that you've um, alluded very strongly to the fact that um, a lot depends on what happens at the next conclave in terms of if we get a, an Orthodox Pope and let's not remember that the absolute, like maybe the Lord, this is what the Lord is bringing out now because over the last 10 years, we we can point to all the villains. You know, they, they've all been exposed. Uh, we've looked mm -hmm. at, like, you know, my friend Anna, you both know Anna, and she's yeah. doing, the, she's doing the, uh, like, the Maryville yeah. degree at the moment. She's doing moral, she's doing fundamental moral theology at the moment, and she's writing an essay on Veritas Splendor. And, you know, you've got all of these things. Are, are, she said, when Fiducia's supplicants come out, she went, 
this is all the stuff that's been condemned by the church. It's all right yeah. there in front of you. You know, if you've studied it, you can see it's all gradualism, you know, um, fundamental option, all like all these things now are, are being made clear. Um, and and it, there's a sort of feeling in, from, in me that this is the last turn of the, you know, that Bernard Haring sort of Charles Curran, all these mm. theologies. And shit, like we were re we've been doing a bit of uh, talking backwards and forwards on the essay that she's doing today. And she was reading one of Bernard Haring's essays. And she said, it's extraordinary how the hubris involved in that sort of theological position where you basically have to, I mean, mm -hmm. something we should mention, I think, is the second reading today. Like that's the first time in what, four years that that reading will have been read, 1 mm -hmm. Corinthians 6. And it was extraordinarily powerful on the back of fiducious supplicants because it's... Yeah. Well, also, it, the liturgists cut bits out. Did you notice? Yeah. They, yeah, yeah. they cut it. They cut, yeah. they cut the stronger the bits, bits out of... Yes. Out of, yeah. I, I, sat, I sat there thinking, wait a moment. You, you're, 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 you know, you're doing this ghastly Vatican II-ish, take out any bits that might offend or, or challenge people and present it Mm. In this this milk this watered down way, I, I know that's a it's another point. Sorry, Mark, go back back to what you're saying. Well, no, well that is exactly the point, and um, you know, to me, it's like it's so weird that and so providential that that is the reading this Sunday. You know that uh, you know Tucho and Pope Francis and everything will have had to have read. It makes you wonder. Go, I'll go back to this point. I don't. I think I've been saying it on my own channel, but I don't think I've been saying it here. Is that like to me, there's very clearly two sort of strands of people involved in Christianity. One strand is carefully listening to scripture, you know, uh, listening to the revelation, to divine revelation, listening to God's word and searching your heart, feeling convicted by the Holy Spirit, trying to change your life, you know, trying to work with the gospel message to, to be a better person and to build a better society. And the other side are these weirdos who just seem to want to, you know, they, like ignore everything that, that the gospel mm. says and change it into some sort of meaningless affirmation mm. of what they want to do. And all it does is it mean, it's like the complete opposite of the gospel, which says, you know, mm. we're broken and Christ has the, the, the medicine to heal us. And these mm. people are saying, there's nothing you can do about your wounds. You just have to live with them and affirm that they are your reality. But the, you know, pro the more, problem think... is that they that that appeals to people who are looking to have their lives validated as they are. So mm. if all the church offers is a way of validating you as you are, it offers nothing that that isn't outside the church anyway. So I don't understand this this desperate attempt to align with the the spirit of the world, uh, the spirit of the age. Um, because it's, it's it doesn't bring anything. So in a sense, it's, it's it just you know we talked about how the synod ultimately will let people down. In a way, it's worse than than not going through the the loops and pretending that that you are able to assimilate because it it can't. It it's not even a question of do I should I shouldn't I. It can't in that sense. So yeah, I think it's I think it doesn't offer it, it doesn't offer anything. Gavin, go go ahead. Well, more and more, I begin to think that um, it's the spirit of Judas. I mean, so in the 12 people mm. that Judas, Jesus uh, chose, 8.5% uh, of them took exactly the view that Mark describes. Because, what, well, first of all, Judas was very concerned about selling stuff for, for the poor, in inverted commas. Though one of the apostles suggests mm. that he was on the take. But nonetheless, he was presenting his objections as though they were, uh, though they were about social distribution. Uh, and justice, and then when Jesus didn't do what he wanted him to do, he betrayed him because Jesus, Judas, came along for the ride, but secretly harboured an entirely different outlook. So mm. we have a lot of people in the church who come along for the ride, want it as a form of, of therapy, insist on trying to turn the teaching into their own terms. And I have to say that I've been one of those people. I mean, I spent I spent a while as in my in my Jungian pro gay stage. Uh, and it's all about your hierarchy of values. If your biggest, if you have a a top value that's different from the gospel, then rather than leave the church and say I'm going to be a humanist or a Quaker or something, mm. the temptation mm. is to stay within the church and try and get it to do what you want it to do mm. without actually go, being honest about it. And part of the problem with Tucci Fernandez is he's quite 
clearly some kind of I was going to say sex addict. That's not quite right. What? 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 He's he's quite clearly preoccupied with sex, and he wants the rest of the church to be as well. And so mm. I'm not sure at what point we're going to move on to the sex magic stuff. But well, I think we what... probably should now because we're running very <laughs> short of time. We spent quite some time. So so let's just very briefly finish with uh, Gavin. You might like to highlight your article that you've written. So if you take the quotes from the book that he had suppressed, um, then he sounds... He, he, the, um, John Zmirak has written a marvellous article saying, here are four quotes, three of them from occultists and sex magicians, and one is from the prefect for the, for the CDF. <laughs> See if you can work out which is which, because they all say the same thing. Mm -hmm. And so the, both my article and, as John has expanded it, suggests that, that, that Fernandez's presuppositions are, are sub-Christian, anti-Catholic, and there's a preoccupation with sex. And his thesis that the the orgasmic intimacy uh, automatically produces an experience of the divine. Well, one of the things I do in my article is to trace this back to the alchemists and the, and the Renaissance, when you had a lot of over-enthusiastic people hoping or saying this thing. But it's only the divine if you have a different attitude to God. The problem is... That it's, this is this is clearly is Fernandez's is private view of the of the universe, but you can trace this ideological commitment right through to Amoris Laetitia and Fiducia Supplicans, because what he says, what he's trying to do is to change the church's evaluation of sexual intimacy and and outside marriage not just inside marriage, starting off with marriage, but essentially outside marriage, which is where it spills over into the whole gay issue. And effectively, John Zmirak says rather more overtly than I do that, that Cardinal Fernandez is, is in the same, the same ballpark as the sex magicians. And that's why those two documents are so problematic mm -hmm. and are not part of the magisterium. Um, a few people have written on my YouTube page, you have no idea what you're talking about. How dare you smear that these people... Um, you know, you're a nasty man, to which my answer is, if you can show me what's wrong with the argument, I'm very happy to revisit it. But just calling me names isn't actually going to take us very far. But I'm fairly, I'm really quite, I, I, as it happens, I know a little bit about alchemy and esotericism and the Renaissance. Uh, and that's partly why I wrote the article, because I, I was struck, as John was also immediately by the, the similarities. So what we have is we have the Pope, we have a Pope who's appointed as his head theologian, somebody whose presuppositions are actually sub-Catholic, sub-Christian, perhaps anti-Christic and anti-Christian, and trying mm. to drag the church along with it. And there are so many people who are secularized and see some advantage to it for themselves that they're willing to go along with it, which is why we're in a form of de facto theological schism. Mm. Yeah. Good. Well, John Zemirik is all very well, but the fact that Professor Larry Chap, who is someone I really do admire, I admire John Zemirik, but Larry Chap is someone who I really do pay attention to, actually quoted your article as the best thing that had been written on it. That, I thought that really did give some powder to your gun there, Dr. Ashenden, I have to say. Well, <laughs> I, like, it was a great that. article, but to have someone like that pick it up, you know, <laughs> Um, mm. who's no mean intellect and say this was the best thing he'd seen written on it, gives some art weight to your argument, whatever the idiots well, on your YouTube ch channel are saying. Not that well, we can now, come on. I'm, I'm, Hello, I'm very idiots pleased to say non -idiots that alike. So someone as ignorant as me is able to remain humble. He's like no idea I'm bored. Larry Chap is. So <laughs> yeah, <I'll tell> yeah. <laughs> oh, do please like and subscribe and share, even the idiots. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, you're, you're in good Thank company you, much of the time. Um, this is, yeah, this is think, a direct contrast to the, to the path to holiness, isn't it? This is yeah. where really the answer to all this, to all this problem is in the threefold path to holiness, you know, the purgative, mm -hmm. you know, the, the unitive and the, the illuminative stages. Of, like that's yeah. how we, we grow into holiness. And it's the mm -hmm. call throughout the gospel is a call to holiness, that you should be holy yeah. for every single person. And it's in direct contrast to this weird yeah. theology that is, mm. you know, it's like they don't, it's like they don't even understand it, you know. No. And Which is why I the, think it's worth um, highlighting those things that it would be better to turn to rather than yes, uh, quite right, Fiducia actually. Supplicans, which we talked about last episode. And some people are saying, well, so you're just annoyed because he used the word orgasm. Uh, Pope John Paul II used the word orgasm. It's not that. It isn't that. If you re if you read 
Ferducci or Supricans, against something like In Defence of Purity by uh, Dietrich von Hildebrand, which uh, was part of the grounding for uh, Pope John Paul II's uh, love and responsibility and his later theology of the body talks. That, that's a different, somebody likened it to something like a, a, a cartoon versus a Caravaggio. You know, these are, they're not, they're not on the same plane. So it's not, it's not a puritanical objection to using a word like orgasm. It's, it's about, as you say, it's, it's, as Gavin's pointed out in his fantastic article, we've already said, and we'll link here, is actually, it's these different, it's, it's a different, uh, uh, grounding the whole the whole grounding is is problematic and it is uh it is something that you're able to i think gavin and have uh, shown to be so yeah i mean there's the whole rupnik link as well isn't there which is really mm. i thought very very interesting so where you've got rupnik who's not been removed you know not had any of his privileges removed despite the fact that he's been involved in uh what would we call it like abuse in a ritualistic abuse in like you know mm. integrating religious elements or i mean it is absolutely bizarre but there's a real mm. connection i don't read the don't read tucho's new newly revealed book people don't bother yourselves with it right it's or if you have already and you plan to read it in conjunction with something like Theology in the body, love and responsibility, in defence of purity, yeah. on chastity, all of these things. It's just nothing good in it, but like it is like an abuser. That's how it. That, it's like grooming. That's it's like yeah. a handbook on grooming. That's what it reads like to me. If you it, and if it, you go back, Karen, Catherine, sorry. No, 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 if no. You go, go back yeah. briefly to the headline um, that the, the, the Pope encourages communists to fight corruption and abide by the rule of law. And then you ask, to what extent has the Pope done those things in his own church? Uh, there has been no real dealing with corruption, the sexual corruption, the child abuse. I mean, Rupnik is the most, Rupnik and McCarrick together are, are the examples of his unwillingness to deal with the corruption. And mm. then in terms of the rule of law, uh, he doesn't impose a rule of law on Rupnik and McCarrick, but he abuses the law to close down traditionalist communities, fire, fire, fire bishops, who criticise him? So, uh, I mean, he he well, it, he simply doesn't have a moral platform to tell other people to fight corruption and follow the rule of law when that's really the last thing that's happened uh, within the Catholic Church itself. I mean, l lamentably and horribly so. Mm, yeah, absolutely. Well, sad, sadly, as you as you said earlier, Gavin, I think it's a really horrible position uh, to be in as Catholics because you we don't want to be sitting here saying. Well, what we've got, you know, either we conclude the Pope is stupid or um, has bad will or is, you know, none of them are good options. So we, I'd just like we, to go we, back to the readings in liturgy this morning. I was very helped um, by one of the, one of my favourite readings from the Old Testament, Samuel and Eli. Yeah. And right at the end of it. So, so Eli, the establishment is is corrupt. And the Lord comes and says, says to Samuel, um, I'm going to deal with this corruption. You can tell them that, you know, the days are numbered. And Samuel doesn't want to tell Eli this, of course, because it's it's Eli's sons, and he's he hasn't uh, he hasn't done what he ought to have done. Eli has this very moving phrase: says, "Don't be afraid of telling me the truth. It's the Lord speaking, and we're just going to have to listen to it and go with it." And therefore, I'd I'd like to suggest that if it sounds as though we're being unnecessarily anti anti Francis or we're disrespecting the office of the Pope. That isn't the intention at all. The intention, in fact, is to defend the office of the Pope by showing how badly the incumbent is abusing the office. And the, and the prophetic literature all the way through uh, says that God wants the truth told. Now, how we tell it matters. We need to tell it with a degree of humility and awareness of our own flaws. Uh, and, and I hope all, we, all I can say is I hope we try and do that. But we are entitled to exercise the responsibility of telling the truth in the name of Jesus, who is the way, the truth, and the life. And the reason we can do it without mm. too much anxiety is because he invites us all to repent. So if we look at our own flaws, we go to confession, we say, Lord, I'm sorry. Lord, have Jesus Christ, have mercy on me, a sinner. Then we, we do have a platform which we can try in the best spirit possible to tell the truth. But the truth has to be told. Eli knew that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's a really excellent point to finish. Thank you, Gavin. And I, I agree with what you said earlier, Mark. I think there's 
there's a frustration, but there's an element in which you can see that the Lord is bringing it all out. Like you said, we know, we can see all the fills. It's like the scum rising to the top and being brought out. And however it's done, it might be being done in ways that we find really odd and surprising. But nevertheless, it's being done. Uh, so that's something we will. Anyway, we, we can we just must continue to pray, as you've said, may continue to pray fast and hope and, and never, never uh, give up on the church and uh, the bride of Christ. And, and also to turn to those things that remain and will always remain true, good and beautiful. Um, so we'll be back with you very soon. But for now, I'm Catherine Bennett. I'm Mark Lambert. I'm Gavin Ashenden, and tomorrow, the ending of another excellent podcast, Pray for the Church. <laughs>